disaster strikes when you least expect it. And when it does, it pays to be prepared. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about disaster strategy planning, also known as business continuity plans. So uh, sit tight uh, and let's take enhance your primary care and learning. Welcome, Gandhi. Welcome, EGP learners. Um, yeah, Gandhi, I gather you've had a, a busy week uh, this week with things happening at the practice. Definitely. So unfortunately, last week we had one of those never events where we had a near total power cut. So it wasn't quite total, but it wasn't also enough that didn't cause a major problem for the practice and stuff. Um, and it was a bit stressful, a bit challenging. And yeah, we're going to talk about what happens when things go catastrophically wrong in your practice and what you might need to consider about those situations, reflecting on some of the situations both myself and Andy have been through and also for some of the ones that many of you listening to us out there may have also gone through as well and what you need to think about in terms of those situations, aren't we, Andy? Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting episode, I think, um, because when I heard about your power cut, um, it made me think, oh, gosh, you know, these never events, you know, um, you know, when they when they happen, it's really, really disruptive, you know, and it made me think, mm -hmm. oh, isn't it good that, you know, never events hardly never happen. And then it got me thinking and it got us talking and actually these things do happen actually mm -hmm. quite, quite, quite a lot. You know, and if you're going to be working in practice for five, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, a few of these things are going to come along in your mm -hmm. career. So, um, you know, initially when when we were doing business continuity plans, when I was a, a new partner, I thought, oh, we're planning for things that will never happen. But you know what? Things come up, things do happen, and it pays to be prepared and it pays to plan. So it's going to be an interesting chat today, I think, Andy. Definitely. So uh, I mean, we're talking about things that never happen. Obviously, from my experience, the recent one was the power cut. And I guess just to give some backstory for those of you who haven't followed the tweets and that kind of stuff, we basically lost power on 90% of our practice footprint. Bizarrely, we had 10% still running, which actually in some ways made it more complicated because we could do something, but not a lot. And obviously this was mid morning, fairly busy, loads of stuff to get through and things. Um, so trying to reorganize and structure things so that we could still provide safe care for our patients. So the staff had an idea of what to do. And also the big one for me, unfortunately, we just taken delivery of all of our vaccines. And that was the that was the stressful part. So for those who aren't aware of what that particularly means, we just taken delivery. We had 946 vaccines, particularly the flu vaccines that need to be sorted and not breaking the cold chain or losing it so that those vaccines were lost. Obviously, the financial issue is one thing, but also the fact that then we wouldn't have the vaccines to vaccinate our local population, which obviously is a big thing for us. We would, I mean, we were mid flu clinic when this was happening as well. So it was all the, these chaotic things were, and, and how we had to figure out what to do, how to fix it. I know loads of people are like, oh, you could just run an extension cable and that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, our fridges were mains wired. <laughs> so you couldn't even unplug them and just switch it over. So it, there were so many complications that came into this. That it was just, That's... yeah, you, you, can, you can see, yeah. can't you? you can see what it did. Yeah. It's great when they're mains wired because it stops the cleaner, you know, unplugging your fridge to plug in their hoover. Yeah. But um, if you lose power, it means you can't hook them up to a, to an alternative power supply. Oh, gosh, I feel for you, Gandhi. Um, mm. And just if people are wondering why why, why should I listen to this and, uh, and so forth, it's going to be entertaining um, as mm -hmm. we reminisce about some things that go wrong. Uh, but also we will be uh, learning some lessons, um, you know, and, and identifying those lessons that we've learned along the way and giving you some tips uh, to help you improve your business continuity plans. We all need to have them. But... Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually how you lose, use them and, and how you might make them better after something happened is, is really, really worth considering. So, um, yeah, let's dig in a little bit more to this power cut, Candy. Tell us a bit more about what was going on. So, as I said, we unfortunately lost power. We didn't know why. Um, we had to try and contact our centre kind of engineers and that kind of stuff, which actually ended up becoming a slightly more complicated process than we thought. I think from the centre's perspective, they didn't understand the gravity of the situation, particularly our concerns around the vaccines, which was the really big one. Um, but we eventually managed to get some engineers down. So we were without power for about six hours in total, um, which um, basically meant morning clink was gone rather fortuitously it happened to be one of our practice learning time event days so actually from 12 o'clock on was the practice was had other cover so that was a slightly less of a stress from that point of view um but the key thing is we basically lost power so we couldn't access the notes for many of our patients 
Um, we had uh, obviously the fridges was a big issue, no light, so we couldn't see things as well. Um, so those were key factors that had an impact. And we basically had to condense what was a footprint of about 14 clinical rooms down to three clinical rooms, which is not easy. You know, that, that's a challenging thing to do on any given day. Um, so quick little things we did. We first of all told the patients. So I went straight outside to the reception area and told everyone apologies. As you just realized, the lights have gone out. We've lost power in this part of the building. The weird thing was it was only our part of the building, not the rest of the library downstairs, not any other places. But unfortunately, we're not allowed to use any of the spaces. So, you know, we did ask. We were told we couldn't. Okay. No further comment on those. Um, but, you know, the the key part was trying to understand what we could do we couldn't access any notes for a lot of those patients we did manage to realize like i said about 10 percent of the practices was still running so three clinical rooms on the other side of the building that we have access to were still able to be used so we were able to print off patient lists of knowing who was coming in and who was not coming in so that was useful um we managed to condense we had three working stations in the back area for admin. So we asked our, our typists, and our coders, who that was normally their area, to basically sit somewhere else kindly <laughs> while we put the reception list there and got the phone lines up and running again. So we still were able to take in calls and manage those kind of things and call out, which was an important thing. Um, and then basically, thankfully, we had a separate Wi-Fi system, which we were able to jump onto to connect to various things. Um, had a couple of laptops. I managed to get my very kind wife to come and drop me off my laptop from home because um, I don't have to live too far away from practice so we had some extra computers and stuff um, and we managed to get a, a semblance of completion for the clinics we got to see that we managed to see the urgent patients had already brought down we informed the patients coming through that anybody who didn't need to be seen that morning could we rebook them back and we will contact them later because that was also a challenge but like I said the big one was the, the vaccines um, and that's where my focus ended up going because we wanted to safeguard those as much as possible managed to find we had some options in terms of we we lent very heavily on our local practices within our network as we're always told to do and thankfully a couple of practices so they could take some of the vaccines if they needed to and we also approached one of our local pharmacies and they could take some of them so we had a plan to move the vaccines but then by the time we finally got through to the immunization screening team they told us not to do anything just lock the fridge leave it and wait it out because that was better than trying to move the vaccines and stuff and lo and behold, thankfully, we've only lost six out of 946 vaccines that we can't use. The wow. rest of them we will have to use off license, but they are still usable, which is the big thing. Um, and we've now just about recovered from it. Yeah, you, you know, we, it sounds like it was really difficult, Gabby, and we'll, I guess we'll get to the lessons later on. You've just made me think, we, we recently bought a new fridge for our vaccines. You know what one of the mm. top criteria was? Wheels. We, we, we got a fridge with with wheels um because we which wouldn't have been a problem for us because ours has wheels but it was mains wired <laughs> that yes. was the problem and it's got a normal plug on it as well because um mm. in our lift building we've we've had lots of episodes of um, loss of power and loss of vaccine over the years actually um and you're right sometimes certain areas of the building have power others others mm. don't so actually having a fridge with wheels is really really useful <laughs> for us in, in case of power outage but like you say, it's that complexity of the other issue of what happens if somebody accidentally unplugs it and stuff. And even I know that one of our previous um, staff members were telling us that in their practice before they came to ours, that even though they had big, huge tape saying do not unplug, even though they'd tape the plug to the wall, somebody still unplugged it and left it unplugged. So it does happen. And then the question is, which of those two options do you take? Do you mains wire it to protect the fact that it's always plugged in? Or do you go for the ability for mobility, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a difficult call, isn't it? Um, yeah. but um, And uh, we're all encouraged to have business continuity yep. plans. Um, so, you know, was, was that the first thing you reached for and was it useful? Or, or, you know, did you find that you just kind of adapted on the fly? You know, how, how useful was your business continuity plan in that? So age? the first 30 minutes or so was just the standard, oh, we've lost power. Let's figure out what we need to be aware of before we go down the route of business on the hope that it suddenly came back. When it became clear it was not coming back at that point, I, I, I kind of, unfortunately, Similar things have happened to us before. So I know a lot of the business continue firm by heart. So contacted the local area team, informed them, and they alerted the DDOS. So that made some other changes in the background so that we didn't have additional stuff coming towards us. Um, we so notified DDO, a page. DDOS, Gandhi, just for the Directory of Services. I've forgotten the, the, what the first D stands for, but it's the thing that, for example, that allows um, 111 to book directly into your practices. 
um, and also aware, informing out of hours that you have um, difficulties and that kind of stuff so that it alerts other people within the system. Because they might bounce off your switchboard and call 111 and they need to know why. So Yeah, exactly. Um, we also um, managed to do a couple of other changes. Uh, with staffing, like I said, we informed the patients. So on the, our social media platforms, put out a quick message saying we've had a power cut. If you don't need to come in, let us know um, and, and stuff. Um, thankfully, we still had running phone lines, um, although that was also a challenge because we had a lot less phone lines than normal. So that would have meant longer call waiting times for the patients. Um, and we had a chat with the local pharmacy to basically say, look, this is the problem. We've got no issue, so don't try and contact us about it because it's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, we made a couple of quick changes. Um, we contacted the local practices, like I said, in terms of our network to make some of the, see if there was any additional resources we could lean on. Lo and behold, it was a busy Tuesday morning. All of our fellow practices were equally as busy, although not having to deal with a power cut, um, but very much appreciated the support they gave us in terms of what they could do, which was, um, like I said, particularly in terms of sourcing spaces for those vaccines and stuff. Free space. Yeah, very important when a power cut. <laughs> that was your particular need at that time, I guess. You know, it was, yeah. You, you can have some emergency kind of cases and care because you had some clinical space to consult in and some mm. power, but your need was for the fridge space. Yeah. So, Gandhi, you got really got me thinking about um, incidents when we've needed to go into sort of uh, crisis planning mode um, at my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was going to talk about the flood. And I've got some pictures of that, but it just made me Let's think. Let's go for it. Happened. But something else happened uh, just a few years before when we were at our temporary accommodation, um, mm -hmm. which has some elements which make it. Uh, it was very disruptive, but it was also sort of mildly amusing because of some of the um, some of the elements within the story. So. The, the practice was located in a converted cash and carry um, building um, for okay. a few years while our lift building was built. Uh, and it was next door to a factory that makes coffins and novelty coffins. And it was opposite the graveyard, which was an interesting <laughs> place for the GP practice to be. And people used to, to joke about that kind of cluster of services that were all yeah. uh, located together. And one day, the coffin factory, and they use a lot of kind of varnishes and kind of special things and things that basically are flammable and one day <laughs> the coffee factory caught fire and burnt down um and it was it was like literally next to uh the practice you know practically joining it uh, okay. and there were all sorts of strange chemicals in the smoke and you could the, the 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 practice actually there was smoke inside and the fire alarm went off and we had to get people out and there was asbestos in the roof of this building um <laughs> and one of my partners was um doing minor surgery at the time removing a lesion from somebody's scalp um mm -hmm. and had to close it quickly and uh, my memory is everyone else was out of the building and um my colleague and the healthcare assistant were the last people running out of the building holding a bandage to this lady's head <laughs> and she was bleeding as um as ash and probably asbestos from the roof next door was, oh, no. was blowing across the car park as they as they ran away from the building it's all very dramatic um but uh, yeah we had to use our business continuity plan wow. on that occasion. Um, but okay. that, was some, that was some time ago. Um, but I was going to talk about the flood and I've got some, I've got some pictures. About Shall we have a look here? Yeah. yeah, because often you, you don't sort of take pictures, do you, when there's a crisis? But um, shall we add that to the Yeah. But um, we did take pictures, actually, just to document what was happening and also for insurance purposes as well. So mm. we work in a lift building. So lots of shared services. We're on an upper floor and above us is a service floor where they have a huge water tank above our admin area, which supplies a large part of the water for this massive building. So there's thousands and thousands of litres. Um, and that tank sits within a room, which in itself is a tank. So if there's a leak in that, um, in the main tank, it's supposed to be captured in the secondary tank, which is the floor mm -hmm. of this building. But both failed at the same time over a weekend and thousands of gallons of water uh, flooded through the practice straight through the admin area so we'll just have a look mm -hmm. for those people who are on the podcast you can see um, a polystyrene sort of tiled roof with a big hole in it has removed all the the tiles basically everything in in that big admin area was was destroyed <laughs> um, all the desks a large portion of the computers um just got completely soaked with water uh so we're seeing a room with all of the tiles removed um hats off to the lift building they um they sent lots of people to help us and they got us up and running really, really quickly. I uh, was just seeing skirting boards removed here, tiles and rooms. And, um, and then, so we did, <laughs> we did notify the locality team of the CCG, um, 
they did allow us to divert our telephone calls to NEMS for, for a day while we adapted and got up, up and running. Um, and um, yeah, we had to sort of think on our feet really and it involved us prioritizing you know, urgent care. Fortunately, a lot of our clinical rooms were unaffected. Um, mm -hmm. So we were able to prioritize emergency care. We did actually have power. We did have access to our clinical records and systems, made sure that we were dealing with emergencies first. And then actually we were able to deal with some of the routine care, but our consulting room capacity was reduced because we had to move essential admin functions into other areas. So people are seeing some pictures of our receptionists um, oh, just got off screen. Let's bring them back. We're seeing pictures of our receptionists um, working from clinical rooms, uh, crowned with. Uh, wow. That is um, one packed clinical room. That's your mind surgery one, isn't it? I think. Yeah, that's the mind surgery room with uh, four desks for admin people to work at. Um, they eventually got a new floor. That's our meeting room. Looks like a 1990s um, local area mm -hmm. network gaming party with all the PCs. So. Um, and that's someone hoovering water from the floor. So it really was um, really was very difficult, um, but just a flavor of the sorts of things that could go wrong. And I think as we get towards the end, I guess we'll talk about um, how people can, um, you know, adapt on the fly plan and, you know, lessons that we learned. But that was something that happened. And I guess the other thing that we shared um, with a lot of the NHS was the um, NHS cyber attack that occurred. Yeah. I think it was about 20, it was about, 2017 here we go here's the date on the wall this is the only surviving picture of the nhs cyber attack from parkside medical practice as we uh, stuck some papers to the wall <laughs> and tried to plan what to do um but uh, for those people who don't remember the cyber attack i'll just give you a very brief lowdown um a lot of people will because it was 2017 but there yeah. was there was a virus a computer virus that i think people weren't quite sure where it came from um I think people talked about all sorts of places, North Korea and, and, and whatnot. I think I think people didn't know where it came from. It was called the WannaCry virus. Basically, it, it infected computers and it um, encrypted data within the computers and made it not accessible to the owner of that computer and to pay us X amount of Bitcoin to de-encrypt your data. Um, and it spread rapidly across NHS computer systems, as mm -hmm. it did many other places in the world. The NHS at the time was particularly vulnerable because, as I think we used to moan about at the time, we were using sort of, you know, Windows XP, you mm -hmm. know, from 2003 or something, you know, in 2017, um, you know, Internet Explorer 8 or something daft too, because that was the only thing that worked with some of the um, systems that we needed to use to interface with requesting blood tests and viewing results and so forth. So the NHS was particularly vulnerable. Um, so it spread across the NHS. Uh, different areas of the country were affected differently, but in, for example, in, in Nottingham, in Nottinghamshire, particularly my practice, um, uh, it affects NHIS provides, so that's Nottingham Health Information Systems. They sort of provide the backup for all the IT systems across Nottingham. And they also provide the phone systems for mm -hmm. Not only a number of practices, but also the CCG kind of headquarters in Nottingham as well. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that they do when the virus is running through, they, they shut down all the computer systems because they need to stop the spread. So we lost our telephone systems. We lost yep. our internet access. We lost, lost access to the clinical record systems. We were told mm -hmm. to switch off all the computers. So actually, you know, we might keep reference documents on our computers. We can't access those as well. Um, yep. but actually, when you try and ring the CCG on your mobile phone because your your desk phone doesn't work. Their desk, desk phones don't work either because no. they're, they're using the same um, telephone system you know, provided at a large scale across the whole area and actually you try and ring other practices and their telephone systems don't work as well. So it was really bizarre. And actually, in fact, you just felt quite isolating. That's quite isolated in your practice. The world could be ending around you um, and and you you wouldn't know. So. Um, yeah, would, was your experience similar, Gandhi, of the initial impact? Very much so. So three days of basically chaos where you had very little comms going through. Like you said, you couldn't access your business continuity plans if they were kept remotely. So yeah, be careful one, where you keep them. Yeah, you got to be careful. We're, we're going to talk about tips of things that we've thought about that you mainly want to consider as to how to mitigate some of these kind of problems and stuff. But like you say, it was just it was chaos in a half shell. Um, nobody had real connectivity and you know, communications going through. And that's where sometimes some of the innovation comes through in terms of what you need to understand and, and figure out and things. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, people probably re remember Wanna Cry if you were there at the time. If you don't remember it, talk to somebody who went through it because you will be horrified. It was different in different parts of the country, I think, but Nottingham 
City. Nottingham was hit quite out. badly because we were so dependent on interdependent IT systems as a result of it, like you say, whereas um, other places where they didn't have as much dependency on those kind of things were able to be a lot more flexible with the responses and stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, there's not nothing to say this can't happen again. That That's, I think, well, the key thing to take. From happen again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they are a constant know, threat. We know that. It takes things to come. And yeah, I think the interesting thing was it was multiple systems and at multiple levels within um, mm -hmm. within the system. You know, so the level above that actually we turn to when we have some sort of disaster was also similarly affected. Um, mm -hmm. And it was quite interesting how people adapted on the fly, actually, because I remember people were sort of rapidly, because no one could contact each other on their, their work phones or their work email, um, people were rapidly sharing everybody's personal telephone numbers and personal emails and kind of connecting on Twitter. Um, and, um, you know, setting up messaging groups quite quickly to kind of reconnect mm. everyone back together so that they could adapt and respond to the situation. So it was really quite admirable. And there was one stage where I think we actually, we had to send a runner <laughs> to, to go to go to CCG headquarters. Like we literally had to send someone in a car to carry a message to them. It was absolutely bizarre. Uh, so wow. people were adaptable and, um, you know, and we got, we got through it. I mean, we had to run pen and paper for a few days. So... Mm. Uh, you do have to think about these things, you know, and, and how people are going to, you know, what you're going to prioritize. You have to provide some sort of emergency system. There's limits to what you can do because you don't have access to the full record. Um, you know, really, you should just be providing, um, you know, urgent, urgent, simple care. But you have to think about how you're going to record that, you know, and, and how and, and and is everyone going to record the same things in the same way, and how are yeah. you going to get that onto your system afterwards? So, which might bring us on to um, tips, I guess. Candy. So let's there? talk about the, the fixes, shall we? So the fixes that you may have to consider when you have these kind of challenges. And I guess the best way that I can help people understand how to do this is you go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. What are the yeah. basic things you need to keep your building and your practice running and start from there? So the obvious things, well, you need shelter. You need a functioning building, don't you? That's the first thing. You need somewhere to house everything that you're doing. Now, fortunately, with remote working, actually, this footprint of that is slightly different nowadays. So there's nothing that you can't actually send, sometimes send people home. And that's what we did. We sent a couple of people home because actually they couldn't do much. We didn't have enough space for them. And they could potentially actually do more work from home because they had power at home. So a couple of people, we just said to them, why don't you just go home? And they were like, okay. I can do that so thinking about what kind of footprints you need so is it you know your actual physical environment could you use other physical environments like neighboring practices for example or the library you know we, we, if it wasn't for confidential stuff we could have sent some people downstairs to the library and got power and electricity and things or if we could have used some of those rooms in the building we would have had more of, you know th those are things to consider so it's your shelter isn't it that's the first thing would you agree with that andy yeah i definitely agree with that um and i would i would always back up a little bit as well and just think about planning you know mm -hmm. for it so we all have business continuity plans we need to have them yeah. and um and you know you, you can you know you can download a template from all sorts of different places and you know get an effective business continuity plan but you know it's funny how how you use those or don't use those in a crisis actually and and, and, yeah. and the way i and actually what actually happens is is often not what you expect will happen or it doesn't plan, pan out in a way that you expect so you've got to plan but also be ready to be you know adaptable uh, mm -hmm. but i think the plan needs to definitely contain the resources you need to be adaptable so i would say people's contact details you know, yep. uh, mobile telephone numbers the contact details for your you know your key supporting services you know your telephone company power company your water mm -hmm. company um the number that you need to call at the the locality team because you might not be able to pull that off your computer you know you might actually need that printed in your hard copy of the business continuity plan your insurers um you know actually just anything that you can think that you might need you know just make mm -hmm. sure that you've got that accessible um you know beyond that i think it's difficult to plan for particular scenarios so you just have to have the resources ready and you know be prepared to um, to be creative and be adaptable on the fly but yeah i'd agree with that first thing shelter i mean oh a lot of business continuity plans will encourage you to have a, a buddying um, arrangement, you know, with mm. either local accessible space. I think we have a buddying arrangement with a local church in our, mm. uh, you know, who will provide us kind of mutual aid in terms of uh, shelter. Should we 
need it. And I know during COVID, we were encouraged to um, to buddy up with other practices to provide, you know, to um, work out of each other's space should the need arise. Um, so you know, those could form the basis of network continuity plans, you know, moving out of the COVID era. But yeah, shelter, I'd agree with that, Candy. Where would, where, where would you go next in terms of tips? Next be power. Um, so obviously my practice was in a situation where we had no power, but a couple of tips that may help with that. So number one, consider if you could in your own building have a portable generator, is that something you want to consider? Um, but if not, you can nowadays get these significantly larger battery packs that can last several devices and even plugs themselves for a few hours um, by keeping them charged and stuff. So, you know, you're talking two, 300 quid minimum um, for these kind of pieces of kit, but you've at least got um, electricity that is portable and usable if you didn't want to go down the route of having a portable generator. Other option, which I know many people have commented when I asked this, is just have a really, 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 really long extension cable. So you can borrow electricity from somebody like in the next building or, you know, down the road or something like that, um, which potentially could have been done, like with the fridge issue and stuff, if we could have mains, mains wider and stuff. Um, so, you know, think about how would you access power if your building was to go without power? What could you do? What's the minimum stuff you'd need? And I guess with that, we talked about it earlier as well, telephony. So maybe uh, most people have their own mobile phones, which m would normally be happy to use in those kind of situations. But do you need, for example, a bat phone um, effectively to use that should be ideally kept a single line for the practice to use if things were to go haywire and stuff? Um, and what network also to consider is that? connected to so maybe actually having one that's not on the same network as everybody else in the practice if that happens to be the situation just on your chance it was to go do valley and things yeah so you, you you're, you're going into like this territory of, of redundancy so yeah. you know backup backups for backups you know not just one backups for backups. Um, not just one mobile phone provider but but a few mobile phone providers you know so definitely it goes down you know everybody's phone doesn't go down so yeah think in that way um, so we, we've covered power, we've covered shelter, okay? Um, internet, I guess, is one. So do you have redundancies when it comes to the type of data flows that you've got? So again, most people now have mobile phones. You can hotspot if that's a possibility. So if one network goes down, you've got hopefully, you know, if all the networks go down, to be honest, we're all a bit screwed, aren't we? Um, but, you know, it, it's a, a consideration of that. Or do you have a separate Wi-Fi system you can use? I know many practices now have a separate Wi-Fi system they can use. Within our building, since the library was still up and running, we could have patched into the uh, library Wi-Fi, which is what we did using VPN tokens. So we were actually still able to keep up and running with the laptop devices that we had. So, again, consider how you'd access data and that kind of stuff as well. Next one would be light. Um, so thankfully, this happened in the middle of the day. But imagine if this happened in the middle of winter at 8 a.m. in the morning or 4 p.m. in the afternoon when it is pitch black. What are you going to do about that? So torches. And I guess the other thing is how are you going to power those torches? So maybe have the kinetic wind-up versions and stuff as well for, for absolute redundancy or just have... Wow, are we talking setup. nuclear winter here, Gandhi? I, well, <laughs> you know what? People laugh, but actually I, I put a, a post out asking people, what would you do? And actually these are the things that people were thinking about and had thought about. So maybe you need to consider that kind of stuff as well. So again, it comes down to your comfort level, doesn't it? How far down the redundancy pathway are you going to go? Or how far is it going to be going like, well, we're just going to shut shop, okay? But actually, that's one of the things you may or may not want to take the decision to do. So we talked about light. We talked about electricity. We talked about shelter. Heat, um, again, need to think about. So blankets, jackets, that kind of stuff. Again, most people should be covered, but do you want to consider those kind of things? And then the other essential is food and water um you need food and water when this goes wrong so hopefully you'll have nearby shops you could lean on if you need to but a cuppa a nice cuppa actually is an essential thing in a crisis so having a backup kettle um that you always have access to and hot water and tea bags so i've actually got an emergency staff of tea, stash of tea bags in my room for if anything ever was to go chaotic and stuff. Be behind so, some glass, break in case of emergency. Break in case of emergency, or if Gandhi's about to lose it, this is your emergency. So people laugh, but my staff know that I have threatened numerous times. So there's ever a day I came into work and there was no tea bags, I would literally just walk out the door. So, so they know, have an emergency stash of tea bags for me. You, you make a good point though, Gandhi. There's something for about ordering some pizzas for the staff, you know, yes. if, um, if you're having a difficult time and, you know, looking after people's basic needs i think that's mm -hmm. that's really important um I'm, I'm i'm a great believer in 
in adaptability um, mm -hmm. you know, in the face of a crisis. And there are certain you know tools and things which are which are really really um, really really adaptable. So there tend to be more laptops and uh, more Wi-Fi enabled mm -hmm. laptops around than they used to be. And those were a really, really useful tool. So um, because they're able to work from different places, different places in the building, you know, there's been times when we didn't have access to our main, um, our main building because of power issues. And we've kind of moved to other areas. They did let us use other areas within our building, but actually it's having the laptops and it's having, it's knowing where those laptops are, who mm -hmm. has them and knowing to, ask everyone to bring it in you know at the first hint of a crisis um yeah. so because you can those are those are about the most kind of useful uh, tool that you've got they've got batteries as well you can power them from battery packs different power supplies they can be charged at home mm -hmm. um you know and, um, and of course you can use your mobile phones for an awful lot in terms of calling out in terms of setting up data hotspots yeah. um in terms of communicating when other forms of communication aren't working uh, mm -hmm. within your building um and you, know, you can access resources and also um you know i was quite glad that i had the paper copy of the oxford handbook of general practice when you know during the the wanna cry um cyber attack uh, instance i was very pleased that we had some pen that we had some paper that we had the wherewithal to ask everybody to record their data in the same in the same way so that we could re-enter it into the computer you know just, mm -hmm. just back to medical school presenting complaint history compl presenting complaint you know, relevant past medical history, drugs history, social history, yeah. just so that it could be easily coded um, and put on the computer afterwards. Um, don't assume that everybody's going to automatically record things in a way that's amenable to, 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 to going back on the computer because people won't unless you show some leadership. And I suppose that's the final thing that I was just going to sort of raise and, and ask you about, really, because it's about um, kind of realising when things are going wrong and then having that right. What do we do? And just taking a brief pause to plan effectively mm -hmm. and when we've done that before um you know we've made a plan and then we always think right communication right we communicate with the staff communicate with the patients communicate with the other parts of the system because yeah. you can forget to do that in the immediate event of a crisis so planning and leadership i would say are really, really important as well and i think that with that there's a couple of other things as well so reviewing the process as it happened so as soon as we went through the whole thing we had the power back on actually i called a meeting of the practice we kind of asked everyone what they thought went well what could have been better so we had that instant learning we've already started the learning event analysis process so we how we can learn from this so we can um you know make sure that in future situations if it ever was to happen again we were more prepared so it's one thing we learned even though we have a brand new fridge um, having a remote data logger that we can access because one of the questions we had was we couldn't actually check the data logger for the fridge temperatures without opening the fridge and we couldn't open the fridge because then we broke the cold chain so having a remote access data logger was the thing despite the fact we've got a brand new fridge so you know we thought that we don't need to consider that but there's a bit of learning for you um i guess unique to the vaccine situations having this ability to shift the vaccines if you needed to and how you're going to do that now, unfortunately, we were in a situation where we'd just taken delivery of all of our flu vaccines, so the worst possible time it could have happened. But we have portable fridge um, units as well as we have a portable um, icebox kind of thing that can take about 100 odd vaccines. So on a normal day, we would have been fine. And actually borrowing from the local practices, we would have been fine if that had to happen. It just unfortunate. It was the day after we'd taken our delivery of flu vaccines. So less useful in that situation. And last things, good old pen and paper actually having some of that and, and pen and paper that could be effective so paper um, documentation tools that structure out the history and everything else that you need for recording so actually I, i'm redoing ours in the wake of the power cut um, and actually more than happy to share that with the egp learners and stuff and what it will look like and stuff so it's going to be a document that basically from my perspective documents things a lot more effectively than the old-fashioned lloyd george i know people said they use lloyd george cards and stuff but actually they're really bad at modern day general practice documentation and they There's don't work based on one of those <laughs> not at all um and i guess if people did want a quick tool to use if you're thinking about this um, I know Andy mentioned that there's um, business continuity plans out there and stuff that you can absolutely use and borrow if you wanted our version. So Andy may not remember this, but I created one a couple of years ago um, called the EGP drama. Learning Drama Plan. So that stands for Disaster Record and Management Action Plan. <laughs> Love our acronyms, don't we, Andy? Wow. And stuff. So, so if you want access to that, the links to that will be down below in the show notes and stuff. So you can have a look at that. And it sets out some of those things that we've talked about, some of the plans and stuff. And the last little tip I'll give you is actually have 
printed copy of it somewhere yeah. in the building. Because as we said, you may come to a situation where you can't actually access any of the devices. And, and outside the building. <laughs> and outside the building, yeah. So, so, so Sometimes the building floods or, or burns down. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, email, having... email out to all, all the partners, email addresses as well. And um, yeah, just spread spread it far and, far and wide. Absolutely. Really. And I guess there's different levels of that. So part of the plan also talks about things like bank account details, access codes, that kind of stuff. That doesn't necessarily need to be shared with everybody, obviously, but that how you keep an idea of that. This is for all eventualities in your practice if things were to happen and stuff. So we hope you find that useful and effective. If you did want to check out more of our content, absolutely have a look at this episode coming up right here. And we'll catch you next time. See you later.